Earth. But Washington has an amateur army and no navy, while Britannia rules the waves. In Boston, birthplace of the rebellion, patriots watch helplessly as British ships blockade the harbor and General William Howe takes control of the city. Howe has such contempt for the American army, he does not bother occupying the strategic high ground south of the city. Instead, his army tears up houses, barns, and even demolishes the old North Church for firewood. While his officers seize the finest mansions for drinking, dancing, and entertaining, Howe's behavior infuriates George Washington, who once served in the British Army and knows well the English sense of superiority. Washington decides to turn that arrogance to his own advantage. Using captured British cannon, he sets in motion an elaborate plan. And on the night of March 4th, under a full moon, Washington opens fire on British positions. British guns fire back in anger. But the American barrage is merely a diversion. Across the harbor, a large rebel force is sneaking onto the high ground at Dorchester Heights, hauling dozens of cannons and heavy supply wagons. Washington's army labors furiously, while artillery officer Henry Knox keeps the British distracted with an all-night barrage. By early morning, the guns fall silent, and Boston finally goes to sleep. Washington and his ragtag army wait quietly for the mighty British to discover their predicament. At sunrise, Howe's lookout survey the horizon. Their telescopes reveal an astonishing sight. The Americans have built a fort literally overnight. Earthworks are in place atop Dorchester Heights. And siege guns frown down on the harbor, threatening the British fleet. A stunned General Howe realizes he has been outmaneuvered. Washington savers his position from the high ground, where he now commands the harbor. He as much as dares the British to dislodge him. General Howe defies. When a ferocious winter storm turns up the harbor, Howe scraps his counterattack plans and decides to abandon Boston altogether. Washington attributes his victory to divine providence. General Washington has vanquished the British. He becomes an American hero, inspiring members of Congress to commission a medal and fortifying their resolve to draft and sign the Declaration of Independence. Before the ink is even dry, however, the colonies suffer the largest invasion ever mounted by the Crown. The British have never lost a war. They are not about to lose America. 300 ships sail into New York Harbor. 30,000 troops, more than the population of our largest city. We shall give these scoundrels a hearty thrashing, a British officer promises, in putting an end to this business. Washington's raw troops fight valiantly, but they are no match for British regulars who flog the rebels in Brooklyn, Manhattan, White Plains, Fort Washington, and Fort Lee. The demoralized Americans are chased for months on end. British General Cornwallis hounds Washington across New Jersey and into Pennsylvania before finally turning back to New York and winter quarters. He assumes Washington is beaten, and come the spring thaw, the rebellion will have melted away. Many Americans share this pessimism. 
even veteran troops plan to head home when their enlistments expire on January 1st. These are the times that try men's souls, writes Tom Paine. Washington desperately needs a victory. He decides to attack Trenton. The British have left behind only a handful of German mercenaries, the Hessians, to guard the town. Dire necessity will justify our gamble, Washington tells his officers. We will cross the Delaware at night. I to the north with Green and Sullivan. Ewing will cross at Trenton Ferry and Cadwallader to the south to surround the Hessians. Knox will provide artillery. We'll place the guns here at the top of town and command the streets. But the Hessians are fierce professional soldiers, hated and feared in equal measure. Washington knows he must take them by surprise. He chooses Christmas Day for the crossing. His password, victory or death. They could not have picked the worst day. The temperature plummets. The Delaware is choked with ice. Sleet and snow made loading cannon and horses nearly impossible. The crossing becomes a physical ordeal in the extreme. In the boats, the men are mostly silent. Thoughts turn to home, and to the deadly Hessian bayonets awaiting them in Trenton. Still, they are prepared to sacrifice everything, because their commander has shown the same courage and perseverance. Washington stands beside his men. His belief never wavers. His stamina is awe-inspiring. The crossing has put them hours behind schedule and they still face a nine-mile march over frozen mud. Some men have only rags for shoes and leave a trail of blood in the snow. Meanwhile, Ewing and Edwalder have failed to cross the river. Washington's army marches alone. 6 a.m. As the army divides in two, Washington and his officers synchronize their watches. 7.30, the cover of darkness is now lost. But by 8 a.m., Washington's gamble pays off. Foul weather has driven Hessian sentries indoors, and the streets of Trenton are empty. American guns roll into position, aiming down King and Queen Streets. Some Hessians cannot organize a coherent defense. <laughs> Sullivan's guns to the west and perhaps the sound of Ewing's guns on the far side of the river convince the Hessians there is no escape. After 45 minutes, they surrender in an orchard south of town. The Americans have killed or captured over 900 Hessians. And Washington teaches his enemies and the world a lesson in humanity by forbidding his soldiers to punish their prisoners. Within the week, Cornwallis is summoned from New York, but Washington eludes him once again and thrashes his rear guard at Princeton. In 10 crucial days, Washington has humiliated the British and electrified the colonies. It is a turning point. Liberty, a lost cause only weeks before, is now seen as the rightful destiny of America. Washington proves himself a world-class general, controlling the tempo of war, deciding when and where to fight. When not leading troops in battle, he writes hundreds of letters, raising money, supplies, and more recruits. Washington builds a professional army. He stays with his men at Valley Forge, inspiring them, keeping them alive and in the field for five long years. But by 1781, American support for the war reaches a new low. 